are you looking at the book uh, yeah it's your browser window i can see the chapter 15 uh page okay yeah, yeah. Oof. all right <laughs> so um all righty so today we're going to talk about functions and if you had a chance to gla glaze over chapter 18 um i don't know why it says chapter 15 i think we oh it's just a, a few there. things of yeah it took a while to merge a few things it's um, all good it's all good so um Functions in Shiny Apps is very similar to writing functions in your analyses. So we, um, this chapter is primarily focused on highlighting how you can use functions uh, in, in the Shiny context, whether it be in your UI or be in your server and how, um, and then he, he provides some use cases on how you can make your code more optimal by utilizing functions. So if you're used to writing functions in your everyday R analysis script, it's quite similar. There really isn't much uh, difference um, implementing them for a Shiny application. So we're gonna talk about um, some uh, file organization recommendation and then how functions are used in the UI and how functions are used in the server. So like, um, uh, if you ever built a Shiny, uh, sorry, if you've ever been built an R package, um, Shiny has very similar storing conventions. So uh, it's recommended that you put uh, large functions in, a, in their own R script in an R folder. So you have your app directory, and then you have an R folder where you would store large, either large standalone functions or a bunch of more smaller helper functions in a, into a script called utils, for example. That was his recommendation. Is it too small? You're squinting, Ross. No, uh, no, Ross, no, I it's fine. You're like, uh, I can't see what this is. I, I can see it fine, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so... Um, yeah, so because sometimes Shiny applications tend to get very perplexed, um, you want to be quite, you want to be organi uh, organized, um, and especially if you have your UI and server are separate in, in separate scripts, and then you have a bunch of functions in separate scripts as well. So make sure to be organized, and then um, strongly suggest to put a. Um, uh, functions in a separate R directory that can be, um, that Shiny can find, like your application can find. Um, moving on to the UI functions. So functions are really, really useful in reducing duplication. So oftentimes you may find yourself copying and pasting certain input widgets um, in your application just with one minor little tweak. So a user might have a slider and for different levels of um, uh, metrics. So like alpha, beta, gamma, delta, like different yeah. um, things. And instead of having, you know, as in this case right here, you have your UI, you have within your fluid row, you have four independent slider inputs where you just copy and paste and merely just uh, update the, uh, the label and the input ID, um, you can make that into a function. So you can convert this into this. So you have a function called slider input one in which the our only argument is going to be the ID of the slider input. And you have the core um, widget inside of the function um, where you pass ID into the widget and then the label is also going to be the same. So he noticed that in his example, he labeled, um, he made the widget label the same as the ID. So it was very simple. You just have one argument, but in theory, you could pass in two arguments to the function, one for a clean label and one for the ID itself. Um, and then the uh, parameters for the widget, um, which are consistent. And so all you have to do in that case is that in the fluid row, you would do 
um, you call upon your function and then just pass in the ID argument um, instead of having to do it four times. This is still a little bit redundant. Um, when I was reading this, I was like, this is still a bit redundant. You still have four independent lines. You just have, now you're only typing one word instead mm -hmm. of all of the parameters. But um, I'll get to a case uh, where you can utilize functional programming to even make this even cleaner. Um, so that's one case. Um, we have another case here where you can customize date input. And here we utilize the um, dot, dot, dot arguments. So the function only takes in the input ID followed by dot, dot, dot. So these are unnamed arguments as the dot, dot, dot. So this is, in, this is basically anything you wanna pass to date input. And just uh, to, as a recollection, when I was reading this, I was like, I don't remember what date input takes. So I pasted in all of the potential argument for date input. Um, so you could pass any of these into your function as well, because you've in indicated dot, dot, dot as part of your function. And then he specified the format to be um, day, month, and year. So this is date input pops up a calendar for your user to select a date. And then one argument that was specified um, in this function is the days of the week that are disabled. And he said, particularly, he's, he mentioned this is for Americans. So he to choose weekdays. And I'm not sure why this was like in the American context, because Saturday and Sundays, I feel like are weekends. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe in some countries, Saturdays is not considered a weekend. Um, mm -hmm. But he disabled Saturday and Sunday. So Sunday um, is, takes the value zero. Um, and uh, Saturday is day six of the week. Um, so the funny calendar doesn't enough have it. For, oops, hmm? am I, am I muted Go ahead, Rex. It's funny that the, 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 the weekdays start from zero in R here when everything else seems to be like your arrays count from one and things like that. So mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is an R thing, Russ. I think this oh, okay. is... Uh, oh, because it'll shiny be calling thing. a JavaScript thing. Or I think like whoever um, wrote the date input, um, they that was a, I think that was a user decision yeah. um, to make Sunday day zero and then Saturday day six. Um, so that's that's in the documentation. If you look it up, you can see that in the documentation. Um, but everything else is up for grabs. So aside from format and days of the weeks disabled, um, everything, any of the other input for uh, arguments for date input is up for grabs. Um, and then we have the third case and this is for radio buttons. And this is for um, having icons though. I didn't fully understand this example because maybe I'm missing a piece of the puzzle. So in this function, he has icon radio buttons. And he says that this is, the purpose of this function is to make the radio button um, easier to provide icons. Um, icon is not an argument uh, for radio button, um, the radio button uh, input. So I'm not entirely certain where this comes from. So how does this function find icon? So he L applies choices to icon. And if this, uh, if the choices of the radio buttons are null, then take- It, it, it seems, it seems, it, it seems wrong to me that the second line in the function body there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I was confused. I was like, where does icon come from? Is it, it wasn't defined in the book. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking maybe this is in his global environment or <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking, it, I was actually it, thinking it, maybe I need a... to make an issue or something. Yeah. Like where does icon come from? Yeah. Because I don't think I could run this uh, like, in an interactive environment, like on my, like if I just created a simple UI and server and tried to 
run this function yeah yeah i, th- I yeah, think it would have to bug be on now. icon yeah it's not being <laughs> defined <laughs> So it was more the it was the values line that I, that threw me because it was like if if the names are null then the names will continue to be null. So he's putting a a null value in values there. Um, so I suspect yeah. there's probably it's supposed to be if not is null. In that well, no, he says else choices. So choices is an argument to the function. So you have a list, so you have, well, I'm not entirely sure how the choices are going to be. Um, okay. I think it's all, the, I think it's the vector of choices. I think choices yeah. is a vector here. So you would pass in the choices and it's a, I, probably, an, th- yeah. that this is correct. In radio buttons, you pass in a named vector for your choices. So you would have the ID of that choice with the actual label. Mm. And so this to me makes sense. So you would, he's taking the names of choices, but if choices is null, like you were saying, the names would also be null, right? Names of null would be null. Yeah. (laughs) I wonder whether icon is supposed to be a function there. And maybe it's something that I, it, maybe it point. like pulls out the appropriate icon for so, supposing choices is like cat, dog, horse or something. And yeah. icon is a function that maps the word dog right. to right. an image stored somewhere on the server. But that wasn't uh, clear. That wasn't that does, yeah, it, it's, it doesn't make <laughs> sense for it to be stored as a, a name for something if that is the case. Um, yeah. Anyway, I wasn't entirely certain on th- this threw this threw me right here. I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know how this is going to work. Maybe icon is a function um, that is maybe shiny. I, I've 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 not I'm I'm not familiar with it. If mm. it is, um, but then then it goes on to actually makes the radio buttons at the end of the function where we take in the input ID, which is a argument to the function. Um, including the label of the radio button widget, and then yeah. pass in the names vector and the values vector into choice names and choice values. And then selected is defaulted to null. Um, but yeah, this, this, this threw me a little bit. So I, I'm not sure I'm, Maybe it's worth either yeah, bringing I think it, Slack it, it, or making an issue or it's something. Probably just yeah, it's probably just not been um, um, checked <laughs> well enough this section of the book or something. <laughs> um, yeah, it does seem a little bit confused that example. Um, anyway, sorry. anyways, but you get the I, I think you get the gist that yeah. it's a uh, um, there are different cases where you know you could simplify the copy paste process of inputs in your shiny application by wrapping it in a function. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I found this, this says uh, radio buttons allow the user to select one option from a set. So you should use a radio button for op- optional sets that are mutually exclusive if you think that the user needs to see all available options side by side, that sort of uh, option selector mm-hmm. uh, with icons, maybe that you. I'm not sure. That's... That makes sense for the radio buttons. This icon is shiny. But what is I- icon? What what the function icon is? I'm not sure. Ah, um, no, it's a um, icons a function in Shiny, and it um, can convert um, it converts strings to an appropriate um, an a, 
it uses a variety of different kind of icon libraries to pull out an image based on a word. Based you're... on the selected value of a radio buttons? Well, um, it, um, choosing the appropriate image is a, a occurring before the, the radio buttons defined here, isn't it? But uh, yeah, it it's... Um, that's what it's, it's doing an here. internal well not an internal it's a a, a a public shiny function so huh so i guess in this line then it is taking the choices here which is i'm mm. assuming is a named vector and yeah. then taking the values of the vector uh passing it to the function icon to look for Mm, matches? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe this is function is just for, maybe this function is just to get the library of icons. Uh, you can only have a radio buttons for a library of icons, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, something on uh, chapter two on uh, within uh, selecting input. So like a radio button and selecting input are two uh, action button, basically. Um, right. So. Um, uh, chapter two, it is, um, uh, which is, um, uh, limited mm. choices paragraph. Yeah, in there's an example in chapter two where he uses an icon to create, um, like it. It's like a way of selecting based on an emoticon. So the icon applying the function icon to angry, the string angry generates the. Mm emoticon for angry and that's put next to the selector for a radio button thing i see so you need to pass in so i guess that's what this icon radio button function is it's merely used in the context of this example because yeah. like it wouldn't just be for a basic radio button, right? Where you can no, just I say, so. you know, one, two, three, four, like as your choices. Mm -hmm. It would have to be otherwise. What's the point of using the icons? You would have your choices in this case in the function would be um, a named vector of angry, id angry. Yeah. You know, like but, yeah, I, I think it might have been clearer had he put in an example of what choices might be when yeah. writing this. Because I don't see, you know, I don't see how this, this would work yeah. without it, because there is, I'm assuming there's a limit, like a finite number of possible icons. So yeah. Yeah. those would have to be in choices in order for this to return values. Yeah. But which is, but then again, this is probably why he, had this is dot null names of choice uh, no no that actually doesn't make sense <laughs> uh, so yeah i think this i think this function is just for the use case if you want to make yeah. icons as your radio buttons. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> this is what i'm this is how i'm going to understand it in my head <laughs> right <laughs> all right so moving forward so remember that example I was telling you uh, earlier up above where I feel like this is still not like very optimized because you're still having four uh, four lines that are slider input, except you're, you're not actually calling slider input, you're calling the slider input one function. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with uh, functional programming uh, methodology and have used the functions out of the per package, um, you could use map in this instance. So 
we can specify the, the variables that we would like to pass to the slider input function. So the alpha, beta, gamma, delta as a vector. And then we can use map to pass vars, the vector vars into slider input one, that function that we defined earlier. And then sliders is now gonna be holding a list because map returns a list. So it's gonna be holding a list of slider inputs. And I didn't know this, but um, fluid row uh, unpacks lists. If you pass the list to fluid row, it will actually unpack it as children of the fluid row container. Right. So that's something I didn't know until reading this particular example. So that actually makes this whole thing a lot cleaner. Right. Okay. So would that not work in fluid page? Because there's a more commonly used UI wrapper, I think. Yeah. So, so a, a you would have of... a fluid page and then inside the page you would have, like, I would assume you wouldn't just put like widgets, slider widgets and like okay. slider inputs inside the page, you would probably want to have a row and then a column for if you were going to use yeah. the, if you weren't going to use the sidebar panel, like you would just like define, you know, if you were going to like grid it out yourself. Um, but I would, I would assume that that would still work. Mm -hmm. So it seemed contextually when I was reading that it, I interpret it as any of these shiny um, container containers would unpack lists by default. So yeah. I, I, I would assume column would do the same thing. Um, but I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So they, you don't have to unlist it. You just pass it a list and then they become, they show up as children of the row, which was pretty cool. Um, all right, and then another thing is turning a UI structure into a data structure so you have more variety in your input. So this is taking that same example with the slider inputs and all the variables, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, but instead of actually um, um, making them a vector, you would define your parameters as a um, triple, so he defined it as a triple here, and then pass that triple into the slider input. So this is when you have like, potentially have a lot of um, input. So maybe more um, like data. And then the values of your data frame needs to be, so like, um, now in this instance, like min and max are different values for alpha and beta. They're not all the same as they were before. Um, they weren't all like the same exact, holding the same exact values. So here's the slider input function in which it takes the ID, the label, um, which is the same as ID um, min and max, which default to zero and one, except um, now that um, so this is the slider input widget, which has all those uh, arguments. But instead, now he's using a PMAP, which is when you have multiple um, argument, when you need to pass multiple uh, vectors to uh, an, a function instead of map, which is just one vector to a function, and map two, which is two vectors of the same length vectors or lists to a function. This is PMAP when you have multiple. Um, and so you're, he's taking PMAP, he's PMAPing the VARS triple into slider input. So um, this is a use case where you would pass in a data frame. Um, so you could have a lot of things. This is still very small, um, but um, you could you can imagine if you had like several columns that you needed to pass in for arguments of your widget. So like if every widget needed to have specifications, I don't know. Okay. That's cool. And then finally, implementing functions in the server. So 
this is a really good way. Um, putting functions in the server is a good way to uh, easier way to debug and also easier to tell what inputs were passed to a function versus trying to figure out within a reactive expression, because that's just very confusing. Um, so one very common use case where this could occur is in the case of reading uploaded data. So without using a function, this is what the server would look like. So he has a reactive expression where we require um, something called input dollar sign file, so the file, and then he's using um, the file ext function from the tools package to um, grab the extension of the file, and then um, saying using the switch function to see if the extension is CSV. Use um, the vroom function to pull it with being comma delimited, TS, if the extension is TSV, then do this, and then validate with invalid file, um, please upload CSV or TSV. So these are the only two options in this particular example. Um, and then using a render table function to take the head of the data. Okay, so theoretically, this is an okay, this is to me, okay like in the server, if this all there was in your application right now, this would be okay. But most likely you're probably gonna have like a ton more stuff in your server. Like you're not just gonna have an app that uploads files. So this would be a good um, use case where you would extract a function and put it into its own helper function outside of the Shiny application. So we have um, a function called extract file.r that would be in our R directory. And we would have a function called load file in which it would take the name, the file name and its path. And then it's the same code that we saw previously. It also with the validate and um, apparently validate works similarly to stop um, the regular stop function in, in R outside of the shiny context. So this is still valid, like this is a still a very a valid function. And then instead of having that inside the server, um, I'm you have to load it. Obviously I'm assuming there's a global function, a global script somewhere where this function is loaded into the environment. And then now you just have data uh, assigned as a reactive expression where we call the load file function and pass in input dollar sign file name, input dollar sign data path, file dollar sign data path. Hmm. And that is a lot cleaner than before um, because the reactive expression is now two lines instead of like 10 as it was before. Um, and he, he made a note um, that generally it's better to keep reactive and non-reactive parts of your application as separate as possible. Mm. There are some use cases where you will have, it, it may be required to, for your function to accept um, reactive objects. So like your inputs, but wherever possible, try and keep them separate just because if your function is not working, it's, you know, it all comes down to debugging at the end of the yeah. day. You want to make your life easier. So. Yeah. Um, but it, it and, helps in two ways, doesn't it? Because it, it makes your server function easier to follow as you're like just reading through it. You know, yeah. because if there's a, if the bug is a reactive bug, then it will be easier to find in a smaller server function that you can readily scan. Yeah, but for sure. Lies in a pure function or whatever um a non-reactive that's the word um yeah. function then it would be re more easily extracted more easily isolated and tested and things yeah for sure for sure um, yeah, yeah I, i'm a big fan of isolation um like isolating functions in this manner because yeah. i i I can't stand like <laughs> huge server functions, but sometimes they just end up happening. I'm like, how did my server become like 400 lines long? And I, and it's just a pain in the rear to try and figure out where the, the bug happened. Um, 
but so that was the that was the recommendation to try and keep the reactive and non-reactive um, parts separated. But sometimes you're going to have the event where you need to do internal functions, and so this is a use case where the function has to um, the function itself needs the user input, um, output, or a session. Um, so it, in this particular case, it would make more sense to actually write the function within the server and accept the user input um, instead of isolating it. So in this example, um, we're switching pages in um, or switching tabs, sorry, in, in the app. And um, the tab set panels input is wizard and we're using update tab set panel that is dependent on um, it looks like, uh, so we have four observers here that are looking at something called input dollar sign page something, um, to see if that's triggered. So if any of these inputs are triggered, then it's going to call the switch page function that only takes in one value, which is the page number. And it just takes that tab set panel and selects page underscore i so if so in this case it's going to if input dollar sign page 12 or i think this is actually page like one two um evaluates to true then we're going to pass in two to this switch page function and it the tab set panel would then select page underscore two with the paste function here. Um, so th this is where it would make sense to actually keep the function inside the server because it depends on the um, these observers watching where what the user has selected. Um, and this is it for the for the functions chapter. Um, I think that was pretty straightforward. Um, but I did want to go over, just like I did with my students, a really good example because it's uh, it's fun and it actually uses this. And this it's it's a little bit dated. It's a little bit dated, but it's it's good. It's good for my students. So um, so I will share it with you all as well. Okay, so actually, I'm just going to do the whole desktop so you can see it actually comes up. So we have, um, you know, this is the book. Here it is. So this is the eggnog app from that Hadley has written. I don't know if you guys have seen it or not, but Hadley loves eggnog, and he wrote an application that will deter that will calculate precisely his eggnog recipe based on a num uh, a handful of inputs. So um, you can see the the application literally only has three components. It has your UI, it has your server, and it has a script called ingredients.r that contains helper functions. So if you actually look at the server, so well, if you look at the UI first, just very briefly, you can see that there are here only like five inputs. There is a numeric input for how much eggnog you want. There is a select input for the units that you want that of, of the amount of eggnog. Um, and then three checkboxes. So do you want rum in your eggnog? Do you want approximation? Do you want rounding? in your like in, uh, recipe or, and then do you use metric units? Yes or no? So that are, those are the only inputs. Then in the server is just three objects. We have two reactives and a render table. That's it. It's very, very straightforward. And, but if you actually look at the server, you're, you're like, what is variation? What is basic? What is ingredients? Well, ingredients is this reactive object, but like what is um, 
uh, let's see, scale, what is that? Um, and those are actually helper functions that he defined in ingredients.r. So this is how they all come together. So he's, uh, if you can see right here on line two, he's sourcing ingredients.r. So those objects are loaded into the uh, global environment and he's creating the basic recipe as a data frame, data dot frame, strings as factors equals false. You can tell this is dated. Um, and then the various, the variant, this is with the, the no rum version, it includes tequila. Um, so this is where you determine, okay, this is straightforward. Does the user want rum in their eggnog or not? And this is where he says right here, ingredients reactive. If input variation that evaluates is true, give them the variant with rum, otherwise give them the basic recipe. And then the magic happens in this section where he defines a function called scale, which takes in ingredients, quantity, unit, nice equals true, metric equals false. These are actually all inputs to the, the, to the uh, Shiny application. Um, and so these, are these arguments are dependent on what the user specifies. And so he says, um, take the quantity and the unit and do some math and assign it to buy. <laughs> and then say, if nice, then floor that, um, that quantity, take the floor of the quantity instead of, you know, having like partial amount of eggs. That's, that's difficult. So, um, and then do some more math to say, okay, ingredients, dollar sign quantity. So this is a, a this is the data frame ingredients, and then multiply that by the quantity. And so you're now you have a new, um, a new variable called quantity, and then say, if the user is, if metric is defined as true, convert it to metric units instead of whatever it is we use in America, I don't know. So um, that's about it. It's, this is like a very, like this scale function that lives in a separate R script is the magic of the eggnog application. So if I hit run app, uh-oh, something mm -hmm. broke. Um, okay, I'm not gonna run it locally. I'm just gonna go to, Hadley. <laughs> it's already like preloaded because I've loaded it so many times. <laughs> um, I must have like messed with it for my students and I broke something. So here's the actual Shiny app. And then da -da 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 -da, Shiny apps.io. And so here is the actual application. And so you can see this is the basic recipe for eggnog and one serving that is nice, like nicely rounded. And then you could also be like, I want 100 servings and it reacts <laughs> and I want gallons and I want, you know, metric units instead of whatever ounces are. And so all of this stuff is very, very, very basic. It's literally two reactive objects and a table, but the magic is actually in the function. So I thought this would be like a really nice tie-in for this chapter because the application is so simplistic, but it heavily depends on an isolated function for it to run. So, cool. <laughs> yeah. And I really it's like this. I, I want to make this eggnog. I want to make this really bright eggnog. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun example. <laughs> That's cool. I didn't, I, I've never seen that example before.
I That's don't know cool. how I came across it, to be honest. I I don't know. I just, I remember that Hadley has talked about eggnog and tequila. So I I don't know. It showed up somehow a couple years ago when, like four, year, four years ago, five years ago when I was first learning shiny. And so I remember this being a big help to me. And so I always teach with this example. Mm-hmm. One day it's going to get replaced, but for the time being, it's... Uh, it's what I use. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. All right. So are there any questions on functions? On functions? <laughs> Lots of questions. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, it's, uh, for me, it's quite difficult to, so if I do my function, I need to make some reasoning and say, I'm building up and everything. Now this is fine because you can uh, actually functioning a list of input. So, but obviously, when it, if I needed to uh, to make one, um, I would require some time <laughs> reasoning. Yeah, so. it's it's uh, it takes a little bit of practice, you know. I think I think you will know as you as you build like your maybe not in the U, UI but as you build your server you know just like as a, like an regular analysis like a, a regular R script it you know when you find yourself copy and pasting so many times you're like I think intuitively I you're like okay I shouldn't probably be doing this maybe I should make this into a function and I think it the same kind of uh, like that little voice in the back of your head, I think would apply in, in the shiny context as well. Maybe I have one question. When you do the, um, so you just um, call the function from the UE? Um, and then either. The set as another function so as a different, you you just mm, do the function once in the UE and then you call it from the server. So you could, but I think um, if it's for if the function is for UI widgets, for example, it's going to affect the look of your application. Then um, then yes. So in I think in um, um the example in the book he had in the uh the it's not it wasn't called the function wasn't defined inside the ui it was called outside of the ui um but then i mean sorry defined and then called from within the ui you know what i'm saying so the function was created um in a separate script so this is why he recommends like in organizational purposes having a a separate script for helper functions like this. So if you have to have 10 slider inputs in your application, then you would make a function for that in a a separate R script and then source that R script in your Shiny application. And then you can call the function in your UI. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, the app runs smoothly. Um, that's absolutely. Uh, you actually call it from the UI. You make it the, the formulation somewhere else because it, it's smoother like this. It's okay. You call it from the UI. What's happening in the server then? So the server in in this instance, nothing because you're only modifying how the UI looks, how your application looks. So the server it doesn't really have have much to do unless you are uh unless the the ui that you are um modifying the part of you are modifying depends on uh like create some output so like let's say you're rendering some output then then you're going to have a connection to the server because then you're going to need to pass in some arguments but i think you're going to make things complicated in that nature um but I think it's I, I think it's feasible. So like if you have 
20 plots that need to be rendered. I, first of all, I wouldn't render 20 plots. I, I would have one plot and then wrap it in a function in my, this is, I've actually, I had a student in my class that had this exact thing and I was like, um, passed in the argument. So the student wanted to create a plot for age, for race, for ethnicity, for all these demographic characteristics in his application, and then wanted to plot the, a, a bar plot um, to show the distribution of the patient's um, demographic characteristics in our sample. So I was like, just, you know, all you need really is input dollar sign, you know, take all those inputs, make your render, or um, sorry, make your reactive context, like your reactive, ex your reactive data. So create a data, a reactive data object, and then pass that data object to a render, um, the render plot function. And so that the plot is just going to change depending on the selector. But that even that didn't even need a function. <laughs> that just needed, a, that really just needed a reactive context. It just needed the reactive um, expression. Um, but you could in theory um, in the server. Um, yes, uh, I, I, um, I remember reading this chapter when I, when I first started playing with Shiny and like, and kind of working through it and thinking, but I do, how do I, because uh, I had lots of like duplicated code and things because I'd just thrown together an app and I was thinking, how do I pull out that? And it turned out that what I was trying to do with functions was something that modules were designed for. I couldn't work out how to kind of do stuff that influenced both the UI and the server function. And to be honest, it was it probably ultimately was due to me not thinking how to pull out the server part of what I was doing into a function and the UI part of what I was doing into a function rather than thinking that I ought to be doing both at the same time. So, yeah, so I, I read this chapter and ended up thinking, but well, this doesn't help me in the slightest. This is, <laughs> this is um, but anyway, yeah, no, it all makes sense. Afterwards, uh, like I asked on the Alpha Data Science thing, and it basically explained that I should really be looking at modules for doing. Modules. Yeah. So yeah, this yeah. is this is the build up. This mm. is the build up for Chapter Nineteen, which is modules. Yeah. So that was, I think, that was kind of the preface of this yeah. chapter. Like, this is helpful, but you know, in he was like, if I'm build, if I'm actually going to build this as for real for myself, yeah. I would modularize. I would, I would build modules. Yeah. Um, and he made reference, you know, like if you want to do go even more advanced, he made reference to the shiny engineering book, and then the Gala map, and you could, you could, you should have all this as a like a nice yeah. package support layout. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I had a very similar sentiment. I was like, <laughs> okay, this is cool. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm I'm very much more intrigued uh, to hear about modular modularization of yeah. the shiny app. I think that'll cool. be a lot more useful. Oh no, it was a it was a very it was a good um, a good chapter. A, a lot of it, like you know the sorry, I should probably we should probably wrap it up to be honest. But the um, like the it was more kind of working out what what type of things should be the input to the functions that are being generated by shiny because you, you can't pass in it, it, it was saying you know you're probably best not to pass in reactive entities uh which is fine because i didn't really know how to use them anyway at the time but yeah it's uh it, it's it's good but also like having decomposed those bits that can be pulled out into functions it makes modularizing easier subsequently anyway i think um yeah. so yeah it is a very good chapter to have uh, uh uh reiterate stuff but yeah i ought to i ought to head off because my dog's been whining at me for 20 minutes i hope it's not been 
uh, I hope you've not heard it. Um, no, no, not at all. Uh, anyway, yes, uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, today's uh, running through today's chapter and, and for it, the, the kind of insight into the kind of things you're teaching the students with Shiny at the moment. Um, yeah, no, it's been a good um, a good session, even though there was only the three of us. But uh, cool. It's okay. Right. The recording is <laughs> there. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.